Tommy was a humble janitor at a well-known insurance company in California. After his boss made fun of and shamed him, other employees started acting the same way. In a way that even Tommy didn't expect, everyone in the office quickly became his boss. Tommy was used to the hard things in life because he had been through them since he was a kid. His father was in the Marine Corps for more than 10 years and sadly passed away while on a secret mission in the Middle East. The family's already tough situation got even worse when the father passed away. Daisy Price, Tommy's mother, was a cook and had a hard time meeting all of her son's basic needs, even though the Marines helped out financially. So she could make ends meet, she got a second job and started an exhausting schedule at 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. In spite of being tired all the time and having headaches, Daisy kept working to support her son. Even though she was very sick when Tommy was only 12, she stuck to her busy routine. Tommy took on duties like cooking and running the household after seeing how hard things were for his mother. He tried, but he still felt like he needed to do more. Although he tried to get a job at a nearby grocery store, his mother told him he couldn't because she wanted him to have a somewhat normal life. She didn't know it, but this choice would have very bad results. Daisy Price passed away of a brain aneurysm that could have been fixed if it had been found earlier. After the passing of both parents, Tommy felt very sad and was all by himself in the world. He planned ahead because he was a serious and sensible young boy and knew that he would probably be going to an orphanage soon. It was bad luck, though, because the cops found out that the boy had an aunt he had never met. They thought she was fit to take care of him, even though Aunt Ellie wasn't really interested in or fond of kids. This was just bad luck. The only reason she chose to keep Tommy was because she thought she would get his late father's income, which would make her life better. That time Tommy spent living with Aunt Ellie and her husband was very upsetting. His roommate and his wife worked during the day, so he spent most of his time alone with his walls and nothing to do. He had a hard time making friends and getting used to his new school after moving. Aunt Ellie became more strict over the years, showing that she wasn't good at dealing with a growing teenager. Tommy could only go between home and school, which made him frustrated and alone since he didn't have any family to help him. Each day, Tommy couldn't help but think about his parents who had passed away and the things they did to do for him. Now that he was by himself, he knew that no one else would help him live a good life. His 13th birthday was coming up, and he started making plans in his room. The boy secretly put all the money his aunt gave him for school lunch in a box inside his closet that didn't have a bottom. He also quietly saved the small amount of money he made from washing dishes, since his aunt was the one who got paid every month. The goal of this savings plan was to make sure that he could leave the cruel home as soon as he turned 18. The house didn't get much attention and his aunt beat him up all the time. That being said, Tommy knew that he couldn't just run away without planning ahead. His late mother told him, no matter what happens, my son, study. They can take your house, money, and things, but they will never take your knowledge from you. So study. The teenager worked hard all through high school and got the best grade point average in his class. He kept his word to run away from Aunt Ellie's house and never come back when he turned 18 and became legally independent. He packed his bag with only the most important things and the money he had worked hard to save, and he set out to find a cheap place to stay the night. As the school year ended, he had to accept the fact that he had limited funds. Tommy started looking for office work, thinking that his smarts and good grades would help him get a good job. But the fact that he didn't have much experience washing dishes made it hard for him to find work. Dexter Harris, the top manager of a company in the area, was the only local employer who made an offer. According to Dexter, look, I know you were looking for a job in an office, but your experience doesn't match our requirements. The best I can do is offer you a job. As a janitor in the building, Tommy didn't give up, knowing that every job had value. He thought that things would get better over time and that he would finally find a better opportunity. Tommy's first day at work, the head of the Human Resources Department gave him an introduction. The head of HR only asked a few quick questions and didn't pay much attention to the new employee. As Tommy left the room, he noticed that the workers seemed unhappy. 
he seemed to be looked down upon by everyone, like they didn't want him to be there. Tommy didn't know why they were acting so mean, so he couldn't figure it out. Tommy soon found out that Dexter Harris, the senior manager who had given him the job as janitor, was the one making the jokes and causing the stress in the office. People in the office made fun of Dexter and looked at each other badly because of it. Before Tommy even started working, Dexter kept talking badly about Tommy's clothes and how thin he looked to other workers. Unfortunately, this was true, Tommy didn't have any dress clothes or an iron, so he looked a little messy. Besides that, his limited food made him thin. Dexter made fun of him by saying, someone should tell him that it's not Halloween and he should change clothes. This made everyone in the office laugh, and they all joined in to please their boss. Tommy quickly caught on to the jokes that were meant to make fun of him. Every time he walked into a room to do his cleaning, his co-workers looked down at him with disdain. Tommy reluctantly asked himself, I'd better keep quiet and hope they don't fire me. He knew that Dexter was the boss and that he was just a cleaner. Even though he was made fun of, no one could argue or joke about how good Tommy's work was. He had a small chance of keeping his job because of this. Since he was hired, the offices have stayed spotless, with no dust on the desks and no dirt on the floors. The trash was picked up on time every single day. Some of Tommy's co-workers admired how hard he worked and refused to laugh along with their boss. Holly was one of the people who showed support. She was a sweet and beautiful co-worker who was only two years older than Tommy and had just started working there a few months before. Holly stood out not only because she was beautiful, but also because she was great at managing people and solving problems quickly. As expected, Holly got a lot of attention from the guys in the office, including Dexter, as soon as she walked in. Even though he was in his 40s, the top manager who wasn't married and didn't have any kids was known to have many relationships, usually with younger women. Tommy, the simple cleaner, asked Holly to go to the movies, but he didn't expect her to say yes right away. On the other hand, Holly didn't think there was a problem with going on a date with Tommy because she didn't know Dexter was interested because he hadn't made any moves. But office talk made people dislike the janitor even more. Some people in the office thought that the pretty young woman was dating the cleaner after they went out together a few times. Tommy ignored Dexter, which made him very angry. He promised to stop what he saw as ridiculousness and make Tommy pay for it. Following through on his promise, Dexter made Tommy's workplace a mess the next day. When Tommy got to work in his uniform and with brooms and rags in his hands, he noticed that his co-workers were quiet and didn't seem to notice him. He wasn't even acknowledged when he said hello, it was like he wasn't there. Tommy thought this wouldn't have any effect on his relationship with Holly, but walking by her desk broke that fantasy. Holly was too busy with her work to even look at him. She was afraid of losing her job and didn't want to upset her boss over what she saw as a mere janitor with no future. In a rage, Dexter yelled, I'm in charge here. I run this company, I run the employees, and I run you, too. So, I suggest you find another girlfriend far away from me, you stupid illiterate. Tommy chose to stay quiet and finished his work for the day. The thing that hurt Tommy the most about this whole thing was how Holly treated him. He knew they weren't going to be together for a long time, but he had hoped she would treat him better than the other workers. After going through a lot of bad situations, Tommy reached his lowest point and was thinking about quitting his job and looking for another one. But he paused because he knew there were risks because the job market wasn't great. When Tommy found a lost puppy on the street, as he did every night after work, his life took a sudden turn for the better. The little animal kept following him all the way to his rented room, even though he tried to get rid of it. As the dog's presence became clear, Tommy gave up and thought, well, I guess I have no choice but to adopt you. His neighbor, an elderly woman who didn't seem to have any family, became worried when she saw how thin he was and how he had now adopted a dog. She told him to keep his cool in order to get by in the world. Tommy thanked his friend for the advice and company and promised to live his life with more reason and less emotion. He didn't know it, but his boss, Dexter, was planning to make fun of him and fire him. 
However, Tommy's life took a sudden turn when Mrs. Murphy, the CEO of the company, decided to visit their branch office. Other workers were trying to impress her to get promoted or a favor, but Tommy seemed the most at ease because he thought the CEO wouldn't be interested in cleaning supplies. Tommy didn't expect Mrs. Murphy to carefully look at how each employee in every area behaved while she was touring the office. As Dexter saw his boss coming in, he purposely knocked over a coffee cup in his office, spilling the brown drink and staining everything. For the past few weeks, Dexter had locked his office with a padlock every time he went home. This meant that Tommy couldn't clean up after work, which made the place look very messy. The mess in Dexter's office was the first thing Mrs. Murphy saw when she walked in. Mrs. Murphy asked her boss, Dexter, what is this? Doesn't this branch office have a janitor? Your office is filthy. Dexter quickly defended himself by saying that Tommy was to blame for the mess in the office. He made the cleaner look awkward and like he had no future, saying that he didn't know what to do with him. After looking over what happened, Mrs. Murphy asked to see the cleaner in the meeting room within 10 minutes. The office heard about this order, which made people worry about Tommy's safety. When the cleaner walked into the room, his worried look showed how he felt. He was greeted by Mrs. Murphy, who asked him to describe what he was doing. Tommy tried to say something, but he chose to remain quiet out of fear of making things worse. Mrs. Murphy finally got up to him and said, Okay, you can tell me the truth. Dexter is making you mad, isn't he? Tommy nodded, which proved Mrs. Murphy's doubts. It turned out that Dexter often made these kinds of messes, and several workers had already told the executive director about their concerns. Mrs. Murphy also said that Dexter's office was the only dirty one in the building, which made her even more suspicious. Dexter had a history of problems with several workers, which led to expensive lawsuits against him in the workplace. Things had reached a breaking point with Tommy. The two of them talked for almost three hours after I told Mrs. Murphy the truth. She called the secretary to get the head of human resources and Dexter to come in because it was getting dark. The senior manager was on the verge of being fired because he or she was making the workplace unsafe and costing the company money by filing too many lawsuits. Also, all companies in the area would have known about the consequences of his actions, which made it hard for Dexter to find work in his field. In contrast, Tommy's kind personality and knowledge made Mrs. Murphy like him, which made her set up a job interview. Tommy did great in the interview, even though he didn't have much experience. He showed more thoughtful plans and answers than the other candidates. As a result, he was promoted to junior salesman, and within two years, he became head of the full sales department, showing how skilled and dedicated he was. After this turning point, the former cleaner was treated with more respect by his old co-workers. Even Holly changed her mind, realizing that they could have a great relationship and asking for forgiveness for how she had behaved in the past. But Tommy still, wouldn't give her a second chance because he didn't like people who take advantage of situations. That's all about the first story and now let's watch another similar story. While Matt Campbell was growing up in a small town in the country, his father gave him an old, broken-down car, which made his brothers laugh. An amazing turn of events did happen, though. Matt's proud self-made farmer father, George Campbell, had become wealthy through hard work and not through fortune or help from other people. George put the last of his money into unusable land in the southern part of the state many years ago. Neighbors were skeptical, but he fenced in the area and promised to turn the acres that looked like nothing but waste land into a profitable business. George had three kids at this point, with Matt being the youngest. Over the course of five years, George successfully brought the land back to life, turning the empty plot into a thriving farm that gave people in the area jobs. The Campbells went from being a poor and unknown family to becoming a very important family in the area, which was beyond their wildest dreams. George's farm grew over time to become a major source of food for Utah and other parts of the country. One interesting thing about this trip was that George Campbell's personality and attitude didn't change, even though he became rich. He stayed a nice man with a positive outlook on life. George loved his three boys, Cal, Tony, 
and Matt, more than anything else. Despite his best efforts to raise and treat all of his sons the same, he felt closer to Matt, the youngest. Even though George tried to help, Cal and Tony were jealous of Matt because their dad clearly liked him more than them. Together, they made Matt's life hard by calling him a wimp and a daddy's boy. This competition between siblings started because Matt spent a lot more time with his dad. George told Matt stories from his childhood and talked about the problems he had to solve to make the farm successful so that they could support their family and workers. Matt really liked taking his car or pickup truck for rides around the land. As a child, he would sit on his dad's lap and act like he was driving the car. While he was a youngster, the most important talks he had with his dad happened on drives on dirt roads. The youngest son became more interested in learning more about his father's business after these long conversations. In his family, Matt was the only one who wanted to go to college. While loving the farm, Cal and Tony were used to spending family money on fun things for themselves. The idea of taking over their dad's business never occurred to them because they thought they could run the farm without any formal schooling or guidance. George Campbell knew that things had changed since he was young, but he let his kids make their own decisions. Even though he was in good health, getting older made him weaker and more tired. He had to face the fact that he was getting old as a farmer and think about the future of the farm while he was sick for almost a month. Because of this, he hired his lawyer, Louis Rawlings, to write a will. George wanted his kids to have a good life without having to deal with the problems he did as a poor kid. Cal, the oldest son, was named to receive the farm in the will. The farm came with many animals and birds, as well as acres of land that could be used for farming in the future. Tony, the middle boy, would get more than 100 acres of farmland, farm tools, the family home, and a small gas station at the entrance to the town. The paper carefully followed what the patriarch wanted. Even though Louis Rawlings knew that the two oldest boys were getting an equal share of the family's valuable assets, he didn't like the fact that Matt, the youngest son, was getting nothing. The lawyer made assumptions that turned out to be wrong about assets that were not being revealed, such as apartments in other countries or financial instruments. In fact, the father only left his favorite son an old, broken-down car that George had bought on the side of the road the day he met their mother. Matt had always been interested in farm cars. He knew a lot about motors and loved driving, especially the sound of the engine under the hood. Even though the old car had emotional value for the sick man, it was in bad shape and sitting in a shed on the farm. George was still sure, though, that his younger son could make it look like it did before. Lewis was worried that he would have to resolve a family argument soon, so he asked himself if the farmer really meant to give Cal and Tony money while leaving Matt with a broken down wreck. George told him, to his surprise, that it was his final choice that could not be changed. The farmer and his wife signed the official document, even though they thought it was a joke. This made the strange division of assets public. In spite of the fact that he knew the situation was strange, Lewis didn't judge his client's actions and finished the papers. As a seasoned lawyer, he had seen a lot of strange choices. But he couldn't figure out why a kind and wealthy man like George Campbell would choose to give his sons such an unfair share of his property. Lewis thought that Matt would be angry and confused when he read the will, which caused a family argument that could have been avoided. He couldn't make things better, so he went back to his office and thought about how he would deal with the boy's anger and his brother's greed in the future. A little over five years later, the Campbell family lost two very important people, their mother first, and then George a year later. As George got older, his health and excitement for life got worse, which was made worse by the passing of his wife. Even though it was hard, he was able to say goodbye to his children. Cal and Tony were looking forward to their fortune because they knew their father was getting worse. Matt, on the other hand, was very sad because he was his father's closest son and was hanging on to hope that he would get better. Matt put off going to college so he could take care of his sick father in his last few months. He now only has one semester left to finish. Matt continued to feel sad in the big home because his father wasn't there with him. A week after the father was buried, Cal, Tony, 
and Matt met with the family lawyer, Louis Rawlings, for a meeting that everyone was looking forward to. As Louis carefully read the will that had been signed by both parents, Cal and Tony could feel how excited they were about getting a big inheritance. Matt, on the other hand, felt uncomfortable and out of place when it was his turn. Strange things were going on, was this a joke? Even Cal and Tony had a hard time understanding what they were hearing because they were shocked. Matt was greatly hurt as he watched his brothers enjoy the money. They had never really cared about the farm, they only wanted to make money from it, but now they got everything they wanted. But he was given an old, abandoned car, even though he loved the land and was truly interested in the business. Cal said, come on, Matt. Don't be sad. Now you can go back to college with a different car. But you'll have to use a tow truck to get there. Matt's brothers circled him and made fun of him mercilessly. Matt didn't answer the jokes, instead, he bowed his head in confusion and thought while his brothers planned a party to celebrate their newfound wealth. Because Louis felt sorry for the younger brother, he was glad he didn't have to step in and stop a fight between the brothers he had seen grow up. After the meeting, Matt went to look at the wreck he had received in order to figure out what his dad was thinking. When he lifted the tarp, a thick cloud of dust rose into the air, but it didn't show anything that would help him understand his father's choice. It didn't work when I tried to start the engine by turning the key. At that very moment, Tony came out of the shed and told his brother, who was now the heir to the house, to move quickly to a new place and take the old car with him. Matt didn't want to be embarrassed any further, so he had no choice but to pack his most important things. He called a taxi to take him to a cheap hotel in the middle of the closest town and set up a tow truck to take his dad's old car. From the edge of the farm, he saw the family lawyer's car enter the estate as he was leaving. It was when the car stopped that Matt told the cab driver to do the same. The lawyer approached him with worry, saying, were you expelled from the farm? I feared that would happen, Matt. I regret the situation, it was your father's final will, and I couldn't intervene. However, you should be aware that he didn't only bequeath you the old car. Matt was having a rough day and didn't want to take on any more tasks that didn't seem important. He asked sarcastically, what did my dad leave me this time? The Titanic? Lewis laughed and said, no, $50,000 to fix the car. He then handed him an envelope. Matt took a quick look at the package and set it down on the passenger seat. He told Lewis thank you and told the driver to go ahead. He didn't open the package until he got to his hotel room, where he found more than he expected. Along with the $50,000, there was a note that was clearly written by his father. This new information gave Matt hope, which made him eagerly read the directions. The man who passed away not long ago told Matt to fix up the car with the money and then sell it at an auto show in Dallas. He was told to look at another car show in Houston if the price given wasn't good enough. Matt didn't understand why these car shows were happening and wondered if his dad had gone crazy. He didn't think anyone would want to bid on that kind of car. Matt thought about whether he should put his only money into the car for several days. In the end, he chose to think about his choices and stayed in simple apartments until he graduated. Besides that, he went to a bank in a nearby big city and talked to the manager about smart ways to put the $50,000 until he finished college. With this financial help, he was able to focus on his schoolwork without having to worry about other money issues. He planned to use any money he had left over after college to start his own business. Even though these choices made sense and were possible, they weren't enough to convince Matt to ignore his father's last request. As he lay in bed thinking about what to do, he couldn't help but remember driving around the farm with George in the afternoons. Even though his dad didn't have a college degree, the things he had been through in life made him wise, and Matt always paid close attention to what he said. Matt decided as he fell asleep to take the chance and do what his father had asked him to do before he passed away. Over the next few months, he spent all of his time fixing up the old car. He carefully took apart and put back together the engine, replaced parts, cleaned the upholstery, and worked on the heavy, rusting chassis. At different times during this process, 
his brothers Cal and Tony came to see him and told him to give up. They told him that he could get a newer car with the $50,000 from the will and avoid all the problems. People said things like, but if daddy's little boy wants to throw his money away and keep this piece of junk, that's fine. Tony also said, I'm glad daddy knew whom to leave this piece of rust for. Matt kept going even though he had doubts. He had put too much into it to go back now. He kept going even though his clothes were stained with grease and oil because he was determined to be perfect. After a few weeks, Matt got behind the wheel and turned the key. This time, the engine roared to life. He felt good about bringing the seemingly useless car back to life and realized it wasn't useless at all, it was a real beauty. Still, the sound of the engine brought back sad memories of his dad. Now, as his father had asked, he had to drive to the Dallas Auto Show to try to sell the car. There were no problems for Matt when he got to Dallas. Upon visiting the car show his father had told him about, he learned that it was a meeting for old and unusual cars. Matt was disappointed when people who wanted to buy his car only offered $10,000 after seeing other well-kept, modified, and unique cars. He didn't want to give it up for a small fraction of what it cost to fix up his dad's car recently, so he decided to keep going to Houston. He was always worried before he hit the road. Matt was a skilled mechanic who had changed many parts in his car, but it was from a long time before he was born, and he was afraid it would break down on a lonely road. Luckily, the rebuilt engine held up well, and Matt made it to the Houston show without any major problems. As soon as he walked into the place, he saw that many people were looking at his car. Rich collectors were mesmerized by Matt's car, which they called a true American thoroughbred and a gem for anyone familiar with the country's history. But what really shocked Matt was how quickly his car went up for auction, starting at $100,000 and quickly going over $500,000. When the bids hit $1 million, Matt couldn't believe he had been driving a possible gold mine the whole time. The car was eventually bought by an owner for $2.8 million. Even though other cars at the fair sold for more, it was still more money than he had ever thought possible, enough to buy Cal and Tony's whole fortune. Matt finally understood why he hadn't gotten anything from the farm. He was confused as to why his father had never told him how rare the car was. His father had given him his most valuable and secret treasure because only Matt knew how to bring that machine back to life, even though he didn't know for sure that the car was worth so much money. Matt bought a house, finished his last term of college, and started his own business with the millions he won at the auction. Soon after that, he got married and had a daughter called Selena. Cal and Tony still didn't know how their younger brother or sister had become so rich so quickly. They also had trouble keeping the business accounts in order as well as their father did. Month after month, the business's profit ratio went down, and in the end, it lost money. The brothers were in terrible financial shape because of too many costs and bad farm management that drained their investment savings. To pay back the loans they took out, they had to fire some people and sell some land. The Campbell family business was on the verge of going out of business within three years. When Cal and Tony were about to give up, they could lose everything their father had worked hard to build. Then, out of the blue, the family's lawyer, Louis Rawlings, showed up at the farm and offered to buy the Campbell's land and business. The money would be sent to their bank accounts the next day if they agreed to take the offer. The boys didn't want to accept the amount, but they had to because they were desperate. So they could live a calm life again with money in the bank and no fears, they agreed to the deal. They ran into their younger brother Matt as they were leaving the farm. Cal and Tony told Matt not to take one last walk around the land because they had just sold it all to someone else. Cal said, that burden is no longer ours. I know, the younger brother said. I am the buyer. You can check the name on the transfer. Luckily, our father isn't here to see you struggling with our family legacy. You're my brothers, and I love you so I hope you save the money from the sale. Matt, his wife, and Selena moved into the Campbell farm that day. Matt still drives his young daughter on dirt roads with him today. He raises her with the same care and commitment that his father did.